Hello, 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 everybody. I'm Nikki Novak, the host of After Show. And today we have a very exciting and very special episode. It is near and dear to my heart. This time of year, I don't sleep. I'm like a kid at Christmas. I love award season. And today we're going to be covering our annual Golden Tomato Awards. We're going to be honoring the best of TV and movies, talking about those that had outstanding critical reception. And when I talk about outstanding, I am indeed also talking about our panel today. Oh. Two of my favorite people, and this is like my personal dream team. First of all, we have comedian. Don't look at me with those puppy dog eyes. <laughs> comedian, <laughs> actor. He's so funny. Every room he walks in, he lights it up. Jay Washington, You know, welcome. flattery will get you everywhere. You keep doing that. <laughs> but I uh, honestly mean it. I, I appreciate it, seriously. I always love working with the two of y'all. So when I heard it was the three of us again, I was like, this works. But I'm happy to be back here and talking all this. So I'm just going to keep pushing. Come okay, here. I'll push along before I make you blush too much. He is the managing editor at Fandango, my longtime colleague and friend, and I used to call him the undisputed king of Twitter. And while he still is, we have a new name for him yes. because he's been hanging out with the Top Gun Maverick crew, executives, cast, filmmakers, producers. So his new name, he has a call sign. His name is Slice. Yes. Mr. <laughs> Eric Davis. Yes. That is my call sign. That is official. It is Slice. A little pizza reference. But new yeah, Yorker. No, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I haven't been in person with you all I in know. a while. Yes. And so to be here in the studio talking about the best of the best from last year, I think it's great. It's like virtual reality, but it's actual reality. reality. <laughs> it's like it really changes the game. So um, so for all of you guys who are wondering, how the heck do they choose the winners? Because there's so many critically acclaimed TV shows and movies. The ante just gets upped all the time. So here's how we do it. We select the TV and movies that have the highest tomato meter scores, and then we apply our adjusted score formula. This formula gives a little boost to TV shows and movies that have outstanding critical reception and made a lot of buzz and it makes them rank a little bit higher. So we're going to be listing off those winners for you today. We're going to start with TV. We're going to go to movies, but just so you're not like throwing your tablet if you disagree with us or agree with us or yelling at your TV or however you're watching, you get to have your say. So just scan the QR code that's on your screen and that's going to open up our fan poll and you can weigh in and you can vote for all the categories in TV and film and then in a couple of weeks from now on our Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong podcast, you can tune in to see the results of that fan poll. It's going to premiere in a couple of weeks. And we definitely want to uh, hear your opinion, see if you agree or disagree with us on everything. So let's just jump right in without further ado to television. Kick things off with TV mystery and thriller and the winner, Only Murders in the Building, season two. What do you guys think? Congratulations, I, by the way. We'll accept that award on their behalf. <laughs> look, I, I, I'm, I'm an old school movie fan who, one of my favorite movies of all time is Three Amigos with Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short. And so Steve Martin and Martin Short just getting together and doing anything is just comedy mm -hmm. gold. Uh, what's really impressed me with this series is Selena Gomez. Like, she just kind of slid in between these two legends and really held her own and really did a fantastic fantastic job and and kind of really it, you know I think amplified her career as an actress because of this show the writing is sharp so good you know I think it had a, a perfect season one and whenever you see that you're like it's hard to follow yeah. up but they did with season two I think it's really great the story is good it keeps you guessing they're really great together and I mean when you have perfect chemistry like that it's like you know it's capturing magic in a bottle I think this show has it I'm looking forward to the next season which is going to have Paul Rudd on it and Meryl Streep on it and so, Meryl Streep? I didn't yeah. even know Street, that. Yeah. Selena Gomez dropped a TikTok yep. and was like, introduce, hey guys, we're back shooting season three. We got a surprise. No. Panda Paul Rudd. And Paul Rudd was like, we got one other little surprise. And Meryl Streep pops up from behind the couch. Yep. Is she the person, like the neighbor, the new neighbor in the building? Have they said? Is they that said the way exactly they're going to do it? it? We just know she's in it. But I want to ask you, because you are a comedian, mm -hmm. there's something about like when you put, like you said, you put her between those two and it's the most unexpected combination like it could have not worked well, right have, so what it, works it, about it it couldn't have worked but when you have two icons two veteran right. actors as well yeah not just veteran comedians veteran actors who understand okay we have to help bring her up and not 
overshine her. We're going to shine regardless. Yeah. Steve Martin and Martin Short, no, they're going to shine regardless. This is what they do. But Selena Gomez is coming into an entirely different lane. And so to trust her, her to trust them, the showrunners and everybody, all it does is elevate the show. Like you said, second season, top season one which is very hard for yep. a lot of shows to do. This yeah. show actually got to the point where people who would never normally watch it started watching it. They went yeah. back to season one to make sure they caught up on everything from there, then go to season two. So again, then you have season three coming up and you're just excited. I'm more excited for Selena Gomez in yep. this to like now she's going even higher on a level. Meryl Streep, Paul Rudd. You're adding all these other actors that only thing they can do is boost her up. Yeah. I'm excited they won our Tomato Award because... I feel like Steve Martin and Martin Short are always nominated for supporting in other award ceremonies, and I feel like it splits the vote. Yeah. And they don't tend to win, so we get to give them an award. I just want to give an honorable mention in this category, The White Lotus was also one of the nominees, and that is my, I love Only Murders. It's probably in my mm. top five of the year, but White Lotus is probably my number one, number one show of the year. The next category is TV. We're giving one show two awards because they won in two categories so we're going to put them together it was tv drama and tv returning meaning it was a returning series and the winner was and they just got uh love at the critics choice awards better call saul season six finally getting its due it was kind of the the show that kept getting nominated and people would always say it's the best show on television and you know not enough not enough awards were given so here we are giving it the uh Tomato Award, what do you guys think? I was hoping this wasn't a thing where they would let this show pass and it never gets the recognition it does. Yeah. You know, all six seasons happen and oh. you hear, well, it was consistently nominated, 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 and never won anything. But I think not just saying that to be like, oh, well, they finally decided to give it to him out of, here you go. It's like, no, this season culminated everything people have been wanting in six seasons of this show, knowing how Better Call Saul, you're hearing the backstory of Saul, yep. and to see the end of Saul, Everything worked out. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think the success of this show is just that what's great about it is that it tells its own story, uh, but it's also amplifying and enhancing your experience of Breaking Bad at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's tying up loose ends and doing all of that. The cast is great. And so I, I always feel like when you can kind of have a show that does its own thing that you're invested in, but then it's also enhancing your experience of something else that you love. Like I love it when like Star Wars does stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like it just makes the experience as a whole whole more memorable and I think the show just did an outstanding job talk about catching lightning in a bottle twice like we did yeah. again, you know with only murders but you know to do six seasons and and you know end with a bang I think they did a great job and Bob Odenkirk really like hats off to him yes. for, for nailing this and, and doing such a great job okay so here's my admission you know there's always famous TV shows and films that you've never seen like this I think one. Leonardo DiCaprio admitted he had never seen like Gone with the Winter one of those things I've never seen an episode of Breaking bad wow, and I've never Nikki. seen an episode of Better Call Saul. There's my confession. I want a confession from each of you because I can't be alone in I this. I don't know. I can't beat that <laughs> confession. Right now. Maybe we get to something else, but I don't know. If it's... Well, let's is there is there one that's off the top of your head? No, not off the top of my head. Davis? I, I do have a confession. I've never seen The Wire. I, I I know I started I started a couple <laughs> Jay, episodes. Jay needs a sip of water after that. I started a couple episodes of The Wire, and but that is still one that I need to sit down and and kind of schedule into my life, knowing that it's going to be memorable. That, but that's the and, issue, and is awesome. if you get behind in some of these things, and I do believe, and we're now seeing like Game of Thrones went back to that weekly release, yeah. or uh, you know House of the Dragon, and some shows I think are better binged, and some I think are better with that slow build week to week. Like yeah. White Lotus crushed my soul with having to wait week to, to week, week yeah. but it actually enhanced, I think, everything, because it was such a water cooler show that everybody was talking about, and I literally could not wait. I was in Europe for the last episode and I was on my VPN trying to cheat the system <laughs> so I could get on and watch it. It was like, it's that kind of a thing. Okay, moving on. The award for TV comedy went to Atlanta season four. Jeff, Jay yeah. Stokes. Look, because <laughs> one of the things I loved about this season is Donald Glover is such a genius at what he does. He ended this show in a way <laughs> nobody expected. Because I know a lot of people saw the finale and were like, wait, this is this this is it? Like, yeah. 
sometimes you don't have to have this perfect resolution mm-hmm. in a show right. that never gave you a perfect resolution. Yep. Like The Sopranos. The Sopranos never gave <laughs> you one. That was brilliant ending. Yeah, just never gave you a perfect resolution to anything. And so for the way everything happened where people thought, is this all just a dream from Darius? And it's like, no, isn't it? It is? It isn't? I'm confused. What happens with Paperboy? What happens with Lottie and, you know, Van and, 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 and earn and all these different things and you have all these different questions but it's just like hey it's out here and so especially after season three with the way they had to film everything and everything being so anthology in a sense it's you know the way it was done i still loved season four and i i think it was definitely one of the top comedies of last year yeah i can see it i what i love about donald glover is that he just always reinvents himself yeah, as an does. artist yes. mm-hmm. in his music in in his tv and in, in anything that he does uh, and I, I go back all the way back to Donald Glover when he started with that comedy troupe, uh, and they were they would they were kind of made a couple of funny movies, and then he kind of broke off on his own thing and really developed himself as an artist. And you see it in the episodes of this show, like there's one crazy episode where it's like a fake documentary about Goofy, oh my god, and like like stuff like that yeah. you just don't see in other shows. And I love that they gave him the freedom to just yes. continue to have fun and take risks. And I hope that we see more TV like that. I hope Donald Glover gets more opportunities to do that versus like taking him and making him Lando. Like I would rather see Donald Glover creating stuff and and starring yeah, in it. Mm-hmm. But like I would rather see that version of Donald Glover than than putting him in like a Star Wars. But I think people like know that. that about him now. Like let him do his thing because he can do so much. And the thing is, he starred in Atlanta, but didn't have to be the star of yep. Atlanta. Right. He allowed all the other three main cast members to shine. That is why we have mm-hmm. Brian Tyree Henry on such a, a rise. Mm-hmm. That's why we have a, a meteoric rise of Keith Stanfield and yep. Zazie Beetz because he understood who he had around him. He knew he was his own star. Let me elevate others. Yep. You're making me cry. Yeah. I'm telling you, I'm very emotional this week. All these awards make me like it misty for people and happy for people. Did either of you watch The Bear? Because that was also in this category. Uh, that was like my favorite show yeah. of the year. By confession, I didn't watch it. And I know people are going to be mad because, again, it's set in my hometown of Chicago. One of my buddies, Corey Hendricks, is in the show. And he was like, so you haven't seen the show yet? I was like, hey, bro, I was busy. <laughs> but I do want to catch up with it because I've seen a lot of people do nothing but rave about it, how great it is. It's fantastic. My two favorite comedies of the year are The Bear and Abbott Alley. Yeah. And I'm I'm a little bummed to not see Abbott like higher in 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 the Golden Tomato Awards because I just think that it, I feel like it next deserves, year it's got to be next year. It's got to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I feel like maybe next year and that's going to be the jam. But also network television. Who knew? Yeah. No, I, I honestly, it's like it's like holding like that and like detective shows on CBS are like holding up the <laughs> network. Right? Yeah. I know. I know. Okay. Next category is TV superhero. We know there was a lot of Marvel, but Ms. Marvel season one was our winner. I loved it. I, I told everybody when I first saw the first two episodes, I said, first of all, Marvel did something completely different. This is like an MCU Nickelodeon show. It's in the vein of Scott Pilgrim versus the world. And you're going to love it. It's a different eye. It's from a different set of eyes than any other film we've seen or TV show. And they did that. Amon Vellani is a star. Plain and simple. She's a star in this. And to watch everything with the cultural aspect we get of that, mm-hmm. that was the biggest thing for me. They opened everyone's eyes to a brand new culture, how things really are. And I will admit, I laughed the hardest when I discovered that the main bad guy of Miss Marvel is the government. I was crying. <laughs> Think about it. Damage control, the government, yeah. is the bad guy in that show. And you're like, Holy wow, they pulled this off. Oh yeah. I mean, and shout out to Miss Marvel. This show's like at 98%, I think, as of as of this this conversation, which is the highest uh, any Marvel anything. Movies, TV, wow. like is is at the top. I think it's it's tremendous. I mean, I'm somebody who grew up in Staten Island, which is right next to Jersey City, spent time in Jersey City. Uh, I think the fact that they kind of came in and and really, uh, again, brought life to Jersey City and the people of Jersey City while weaving in this superhero story and some MCU nods. And I think Amon Vellani is a great is a great find and I think she's going to be now in the Marvels and so to kind of connect TV now to the movies is that that was the ultimate promise when Marvel came to TV Mm -hmm. is like how are they going to kind of toss to one another Um, and I I just think it did a fantastic job and also shout out to She-Hulk because I think that was another show this summer that that also 
also did what I think Miss Marvel did in terms of giving you a different perspective, a different POV, a different kind of way to experience Marvel that you haven't experienced Marvel yet. Yeah, it's pissing some people off, but you know what? Like, I think, I think you have to continue to reinvent the MCU from different perspectives in order for it to have the longevity that they wanted to have. I think this was the oh, She-Hulk was the one thing where they were like, yeah, it's going to piss some people off. We know it. We know it, but we're going to roll with it because when you realize how long ago the show was written yes. from when it dropped and how they predicted a lot of these reactions they were going to get, yeah. you know, that that's genius on yourself to know, no, they're going to be mad at this. So we're going to play to it here. Then they're going to be mad at this. So we're going <laughs> to do this. But then we're going to do this thing at the end that's going to show you why we did everything. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If you think about it, it's like it's it's one of the most reactive to social media shows. Yes, it is. Like it's right. very cognizant of what it is and what it's doing and who will like it and who won't like it and they make it part of the show yes. itself. Mm -hmm. And it's That's just it, I love that. Right. It's like it's like this is what meta looks like in the social media age, yeah. you know? And I, I thought that it was very smart. Okay, so speaking of pissing people off, the winner of three categories, it was our TV overall winner and you'll see where I'm going with this in a second. It's also won our TV sci-fi fantasy category and TV new series category. And I'm talking about the spinoff to Game of Thrones that the ending pissed a lot of people off. And then there they followed up with a whole new series, a prequel series. House of the Dragon season one was the winner overall for TV. Shout out because that was my second favorite show of the year next to White Lotus. I love House of the Dragon. Just absolutely love it, Jay. I hated think? some people's reactions on social media. Like, oh, is this what this is? You're just introducing people? It's a prequel show. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you not like a slow burn, people? Because the That's slow burn oh. is what worked about it yeah. to me. It was... Every episode was filled with so much tension yeah. and so much brilliant yes. character building. Patty Considine... I can't believe he hasn't gotten more nominations for things because he was unbelievable. Talk about like a character arc, a beautiful character arc. But I thought, and I was like, super, super like, how are they going to do the younger and older versions of these characters? And they had the, I'm sorry, balls to do these time jumps that at the beginning of a new episode, when they did a time jump, it took me like 30 seconds where I'd be like, hold on. I wanted yep. to see the X, Y, and Z years yep. before, but then they had me in the next minute. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like the way that they paced that show was unreal. Yeah, yeah. it was really smart. And it, I think it was a great example of watching the entirety of Game of Thrones play out and, and, and looking at what really worked from that series and then kind of reshaping it and reinventing it and, and bringing it back. Uh, I felt like House of the Dragon started in a more accessible way. Uh, I feel like th those first like several Game of Thrones episodes of season one are long, and like you, I'm like, who's over here on this island? Like what? Yeah. Like I, it took me like eight episodes right. just to figure out what was happening in season one of Game of Thrones. But I feel like they they looked at that and they really made this one like you can get in right from the start. I think casting is lights out on this series. It really it, it really upped the ante, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think the risky time jumps. Were, were super cool and and, yeah. and were different and I think they just they they made really smart moves that you can tell they paid attention to what worked and what didn't in Game of Thrones and they they reinvented it here. I'm you glad you mentioned that because one of the biggest things they paid attention to was the opening credit sequence. <laughs> Remember when it started? It was something different. Yeah. And then this, they got a lot of feedback and pushback and they were like. Uh, okay, so go back to the original Game of Thrones music, and they did, yep. and it, it for some reason just changed the feel. As far as Patty Constantine, him as Viserys spawned so many memes. I was gonna say the memes. The memes of him on that show, just of Viserys being like, of Ben Affleck being him. It was just great because again, that's when <laughs> I didn't, you know I I saw that one. you can constantly catch the pop culture zeitgeist. Yeah, you know, and that's what this show did. Yep. They did, and they made stars of people like Millie Alcock. That yes, nobody knew who she was. And now she's like getting all these offers. And like when you can take somebody who not a lot of people know about, and not just one person, but so many. I mean, obviously you have Matt Smith that everybody a lot of mm -hmm. people were tuning in for. Um, I just you reminded me of something. If you could give a golden tomato award for best opening of a series, like the opening credits, who would you give it to? Oh, wow. Oh. I would give it to White Lotus, because that do White Lotus, but you know what? I, thing I, in I, always, I always oh. have to watch the opening Stranger Things. Like there's something about that music that gets my head into the space that they want it to be in. And so like I always watch the opening music. I hear it. Things. And see that's when you 
you know it's good because when as yeah. soon as you said it, I could hear it. I got it. I got it. Plain and simple. Peacemaker. Oh, peace. yes, oh great peacemaker. Oh, <laughs> yeah. peacemaker. James Gunn made something where you cannot skip it because you want to see this dance number. Yeah. People were starting to learn the dance number off of this. Peacemaker, hands down for me. Yeah. It was smart. Yeah, for most creativity and yeah. most like sort of buzz, social media yeah. buzz. Yeah, all that I got to the end of that season, I was like, I don't know if I have to watch this dance again right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I gotta be honest. I think I might have skipped through towards the end. Nope, never skipped through another eight episodes. <laughs> but Stranger Things, you got me on every episode. I was like, dun, 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 dun. yeah, like, it sets in, you I'm up. There. Like it puts, yeah, it gets yeah. you in the mood. In like 15 seconds, you're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> all right, we are gonna list off some of the other categories before we move on to. The film winners, so I'm just gonna mention these real quick. So for TV animated, the winner was Legend, The Legend of Vox Machina season one. TV horror, Interview with a Vampire season one was our winner. TV miniseries, Irma Vep season one was the winner. TV romance, Heartstopper season one. TV True Crime, Blackbird, which I talked about, mm -hmm. and TV docuseries, The Last Movie Stars. So congratulations. We humbly accept the award on all of your <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to our movie winners. And there were a lot of categories and we're gonna go over six categories and discuss the winners, starting with comedy, which is hard to do. Hard to do in Hollywood and get people's butts in those seats these days. But Banshees of Inner Sheeran was our winner. I should say the Banshees of Inner Sheeran was our winner. I did not see this one by chance. So Eric, I have to leave Yeah, no, it's, it's it's really good. It's got a, I, I, what I love the most about this is just its premise. It's, it's just so, you know, it's the the breaking up of a friendship. And, this is what I you, hated about this premise. You, but I, hated I, it. I, I thought it, it was just so interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, it was uncomfortable. It was well written. It was set in an environment that was unfamiliar, but had so much character to it. You have Jenny the donkey, which became a viral <laughs> sensation. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, th there's so much chemistry there uh, between these two guys. And I, I think that, that you know, uh, it, I thought it was really great and it was unique and it was unexpected. And uh, and there was a lot of unexpected kind of moments in it as these these two friends are breaking up. And, you know, I think it was somebody said, you know, open in the early goings of the movie where he's just like, why don't you want to be friends with me anymore? And it's just like, I just don't like you anymore. And it's just like, that's the Jay, premise. This was the um, premise. And it, Tell Jay <laughs> as we go on, because then he says, if you talk to me or engage with me again, here's what I'm going to do. Yeah, he's going to cut off his fingers. And he's like this, uh, he's a musician. <laughs> This is what happens uh, in and, this movie. And like, there are these decisions that you don't necessarily understand, <laughs> but at the same time, it's like heartbreaking and it's funny. And I, I always appreciate comedies that can kind of thread that line of like humanity and that even though this world is completely unfamiliar, like you get it and like you understand it to a certain degree and you can apply it to your life. And, you know, I think there's something really heartbreaking about this film as well as something very uh, dry humor to it and dark humor to it that I think is different and unique and that's why people mm. respond to I see, it. I see it as a drama. I don't like you as a person. <laughs> you talk to me, I'm gonna cut off your face. Okay. <laughs> you just can't wait to watch it now, right? <laughs> no, it's actually excellent. It's okay. 90, 90 97% on the tomato meter right now. And it is, a, you know, getting a lot of award season buzz. It won a ton of Golden Globes. It's doing, it's Martin McDonough, who of course did three billboards. Yum. He's so great with characters, characterization. He wrote and directed. And um, yeah, I mean, Colin um, Farrell yeah. is one of the front runners for best actor. A lot of people are saying, you know, he had such a good year with the Batman that he's potentially going to win for this um and yeah i mean people people are just loving this film i'm more like for me this season i'm about like this award season and winners i'm all about the blockbusters which we will get to um, but i wanted to mention before we move along my favorite comedy of the year in this category um, that was an honorable mention uh, mention was nicholas cage's the unbearable weight of massive talent. I have heard so much about it. that's one I have to see. It is definitely on my list. I've been so busy. Everybody was like, because you it's not what you think it it's is not. at all. The script is unbelievable. I don't even know how they wrote it. Yeah, really smart, really funny. Uh Nicolas Cage playing Nicolas Cage. I mean, you can't get better than that. So yeah, I, I thought it was really inventive. 
deserves to be there. Uh, I also love the Lost City with uh, the Lost City. Yeah, the Lost City. Uh, Brad was Pitt. So good. Yes. Yeah, I, like honestly, this, we had Brad Pitt and Bullet Train. We had ba Brad Pitt and Babylon. Like Brad Pitt in the Lost City is my favorite Brad Pitt of the year. <laughs> the wheelbarrow scene <laughs> is, great. is the wheelbarrow scene is one of my favorite scenes in any movie of the entire year. But this is great. such an underrated yeah, comedy. Yeah, and you were talking about rom coms before, and yeah. I feel like you know we're we're still getting them, but we're getting like one or two a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I was glad to see that one get like, you know, do well at the box office. It had a lot of fans to it, you know, because I think it, I think they did a good a good job. And I think you, you're going to need to see Channing Tatum and Sandra Bullock do more together. So good. They're really and good Brad together. as a sidekick, and then you know you had Radcliffe playing the villain. Like it was so yeah, no, they were all great. In so it. great. And, and yeah, sequel make it. All right, sci-fi fantasy category. This is a movie that. Everyone is talking about, and I am talking about everything, everywhere, all at once. Potentially could win the Oscar for Best Picture. It is certified fresh at 95% on the tomato meter. People are obsessed. This movie, to me, has a trajectory of what Parasite had, of what Coda yes. has, where it just is this groundswell. It's the little movie that could, that people just keep talking about, and through word of mouth, it becomes part of the mainstream conversation and potentially could win at the Oscars and at won our award for sci-fi fantasy. Michelle Yeoh has everybody's hearts. Yeah. In this movie consistently, going as a mother going and a wife going through everything, and a daughter as well. Uh, Kiwan, I can't remember pronouncing last his, his last name. Excuse me. Him as Wayman is phenomenal. Great. Stephanie Sue, the daughter, when you watch everything she goes through. But Jamie Lee Curtis, who I had to watch it twice in the beginning, was like, "Wait, that's you know?" Because it, it didn't look like her at first when she's sitting at the desk. You're like, "Wait, is that that can't be?" And it's Jamie Lee Curtis. And to watch this iteration um, again as a superhero fan. We got Doctor Strange Multiverse Madness this year. And I bring that up because everything, everywhere, all at once did the multiverse better yeah. than Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness did. It showed us a variety of universes, how the decisions in one world can change another and all these different things. And the story is just so well done. There are so many laugh out loud moments with this. I think it is the best picture of the year, hands down. Yeah, I, it's definitely wild and inventive. And I, the fact that the Daniels, you know, are are like winning Best Director Awards right now, like looking at what they've done yeah. previously, like mm -hmm. I would have never in a million years <laughs> thought that those two guys, brilliant Nor by the way. Nor they, by yeah, the way. <laughs> I mean, they are brilliant guys, but the fact that they, are, that, that they have made it here, I think is a phenomenal story. I think my favorite awards narrative this year is the Kihu Kwan and Kihu Angela Kwan, Bassett me, yes. winning those supporting categories. I think that is the best awards narrative that's happening right now. And he is phenomenal. The first call that he got, fu funnily enough, was from Kevin Feige, yeah. asking him to join the MCU so in Loki season two. So he's going to go from one multiverse narrative to another <laughs> multiverse narrative. But I think you're right. Uh, and I, th I imagine Marvel Studios watched this film carefully to see like just how they pulled it off uh, in, w within one film and telling a complete story. The family's great, the cast is great. I mean, is it as accessible as CODA? No. Right. Um, and so I think that if it doesn't win Best Picture, I think it, the accessibility of it and how wild of it uh, is may turn some Oscar voters off, but I definitely think it's gonna be up there and it's gonna be, you know, between that and like Maverick and the Fablemans for sure. I'm gonna be slightly controversial. I didn't love this movie. I loved the performances, mm -hmm. but I think maybe my head is so chaotic that it was just <laughs> too much chaos. I was just, it bounced off me. I was like, it's too much, I can't take it. But I that said, the performances were some of my favorite performances. Just overall as a movie, it just a hundred. It just didn't work for me in the sense is I just kept I kept feeling like I was caught in a vortex that I couldn't get out of. It was chaotic, but it's yeah. also you know we're in this day and age of people who say they watch movies but still have their phones in their hands. Yep. This is one of those movies you cannot do that. No. Oh, I did. <laughs> See, that's why. That's why. <laughs> no, the second time meaning um, I tried a second time. I'm like I'm missing something here. I'm okay. missing something. But that said, Michelle Yeoh is one of my favorite actresses, hands down. Yeah. Um. Key is, I mean, the fact that his, this is the narrative this year with award season of between him and Brendan Fraser of these people who genuinely are winning awards and you feel the pain of all the years they didn't work yeah. and all the years that no one would give them a shot and how much they 
truly get on that stage and appreciate the award and appreciate the moment and are in the moment. Okay, so we're gonna move on. This movie won two awards. It won for animation and streaming, her best animation and streaming film of the year. No surprise, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. What more? I mean, it is brilliant. He is brilliant. I've watched him, it yet. This is what yeah. I haven't had a chance to see yet. It I, took I want him to catch it. Thousand days to film this movie, stop motion animation, the amount of detail and painstaking Ooh. process that he went through to make this movie. But every single shot and frame you feel is made out of love. You have chills watching it throughout. I don't know how you felt yeah, about I it. Yeah, I think Guillermo is is one of the the best uh, filmmakers and and crafts. I, I mean, he's just phenomenal, and he's a super warm guy. And he, the love that he has for not just like genre filmmaking, but storytelling, and uh, I think I, I think it's all poured into this film and really poured into everything that that he does. And I love that like Netflix gave him an opportunity to make this because there, you know, I think a lot of people passed on it. Um, and I, that's kind of the story of his career is people passing on his ideas and then somebody takes a chance and yeah. it's like amazing. Um, and he's still going through that even after winning best at picture for the shape of water. Right. He's still struggling to kind of get his stories told at the mountains of madness is another one that he's been struggling for many years to make. And it kind of still blows my mind that people aren't investing in him more because I think he's just a brilliant storyteller. I, I, one of the, I think animation. Yeah. This one had it on lock with the yeah. surprising thing there is, is best streaming movie. If you think of all of the movies yeah. Yeah. that come out that, you know, on, on streaming services, that this one is the mm -hmm. best. Uh, I think that that is is a super notable award right there. Do you think it helps that the other Pinocchio film with Tom Hanks, people wanting to see the difference? It does. I thought you were going to say, does it help that all the other streaming movies were not good? That too. That's the second. Because a lot of straight to streaming movies that dropped this year, people were like, oh, I'm going to watch. Oh, I watched. That was a bit of the narrative this year, yeah, is that people kind of fell off like streaming film. And what, that was a beautiful thing about theater coming back and Top Gun yes. and that narrative. Is, you know, yeah. But I interrupted you. No, no worries. It was just the, op the doors were open to theaters again in full and people wanted to be out. But you had the Pinocchio film with yeah. Tom Hanks and a lot of people did not feel that movie. So to see something different in a stop motion animated way with Guillermo del Toro, by the way, who his name just resonates. And it's not saying Tom Hanks' name doesn't resonate, but you're like, all right, I gave it one to try. Let's see the other. And now this gets the bigger praise. And so that spreads the word. You yeah. think that was why? Well, and he understands that, like, if you go back to these original fairy tales, like, they're all pretty crazy. And, mm -hmm. like, yeah. you know, uh, I think a lot of people look at these tales because they discovered them in the Disney cartoons. And so it's this very sanitized version of the fairy tale. Uh, and that's what people know of Pinocchio. They don't know these original stories, the original tales, the original books where they they kind of took some risks and they were a little crazy and there there were horror elements to them mm -hmm. and i think guillermo del toro is, is a filmmaker that really appreciates where they originally came from and, and telling those stories and, and i think because this was a unique version of pinocchio that we hadn't experienced yet uh i think that's why it resonated more this is such a strong category this year and i really wanted to mention a couple others that i just love turning red i absolutely Loved that film growing up in Toronto. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish was also uh, something that people really good, loved. Super Puss unexpected. Good. Antonio Banderas back at it. Listen, yeah. you can't go wrong. You know, and I, I you know, I, I, I kind of crack on Netflix sometimes for their movies, but uh, I do. I want to shout out Netflix for their animation choices. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. I think every year they are they have a, a movie that's always in the mix. And I think they take risks with their animation content. Uh, and I think they're making some, uh, you know, some really interesting moves that, you know, I would put them beside Pixar and Disney and say that yeah. Mm -hmm. Netflix animation, I think that's the, the some of the strongest content they're making right now, I think, in, in at least in the film space, is in the animated space. Yeah, it's there are some great... Um Marcel the Shell, which you, yeah, it, that's awesome. another one that people mm -hmm. love. Um, okay, so I'm going to have to defer to the two of you on this next category. It is my least favorite genre, and I did not see this movie. But the winner in the horror genre was X. Mm. I loved X. <laughs> so did I, yeah. I loved it. I remember a friend and I, we went to go see it. it just one, you want to go see this X movie? Sure. And you watch it, and it's nothing what you expect at all. Give us the premise. So it's about, uh, it's like the 70s, there's this fledgling like porn company, they wanna make a porn in a certain way, but they go rent out a farmhouse 
from this couple. This is before like Airbnbs. And so you got the director, his girlfriend, who's one of the stars, another girl, he, she's a rising star. You got Kit Cuddy, Scott Muscuti, who's, who's amazing in this. He's the male guy. He's the male star. Then you have the uh, cinematographer and his young girlfriend. They're both filming. She's doing sound. And come to find out, the older lady that lives in the house with the older man, she remembers the days of her youth when she was beautiful and vibrant and stuff. And all of a sudden, just goes crazy out of nowhere. And when it happens, you're just like, wait. As a female, I can relate to that. <laughs> she just starts murdering people. Like It sounds like a comedy. <laughs> you would laugh. Oh, don't get me wrong. You're good. If you watch this, you will laugh at a lot. A lot. It's good. I, I think what's so great about this film is that it, it is a throwback to the 70s, but it's also a throwback to a kind of horror that doesn't really exist these days. And it's the kind of horror that is not afraid to be sexy and is not afraid to turn you on. Uh, and then once it turns you on, then it brings the crazy out. Yep. And I feel like a lot of horror in the 70s and, and into the 80s, you know, they did that really well. And then we kind of started saying, uh, let's not have too much sex in our horror movies anymore, you know. Uh, and, but I do think that there's a lot of value there in kind of taking an audience in one direction and then kind of completely flipping it. And now you're in another direction. I think this film does that really well. I think it's actually more successful than Pearl, which was a prequel. To yes. X, but I would recommend watching X and Pearl uh, for that experience and they're making a third one now to that, um, uh, that's a, like a thing of 90s set yeah. and so I'm curious to see what, what director Ty West kind of take on the 90s horror and what that genre looked like back then but more horror more sex and horror <laughs> or less like more like kind of you know give like, me the old school yeah. Friday the 13th where you kill the kids they was getting to eat listen it's you best. had me at turn you on I'm yeah. gonna be watching this thing the best, horror, the, best, <laughs> the best horror I think is the kind of horror that takes you in one direction and then pulls yeah. you into another one Mia Goth is that a star too. Yeah, Mia Goth is because she plays Maxine and Pearl in this movie, which you don't realize at first, and then you're like, wait, and then there's a scene between the two of them that just fr it's it freaks you out so much yeah. of what it does. You two really Phenomenal. sold me on this, my, and I, I would also shout out Barbarian, another horror yeah. movie from the year that also in a in not not very the same, but takes a left turn. Uh, and that left turn goes crazy, and I, I like that. It kind of takes you in one direction, and then it says, nope, we're gonna take you here, we're gonna put you over here, and this is how <laughs> you're experiencing the film for the rest of the time. I like it when movies do that. You didn't see Barbarian because you don't like horror. Did you, I, li I liked it, but I was really to the point with Barbarian, I was like, both of them deserve to die. Yeah, no, I mean... <laughs> you, you, if you watch it, you'll see where you were like, they both of the leads deserve to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you can, you can, you can poke a, a lot of holes in that movie once you step away from it and look back on it, but I love the risk that it takes yes. halfway through. I think it's great. All I keep hearing about that movie is no little as possible going into it. Yeah. Like, yes. Just no, as little, little as possible. As possible yeah. Which I know nothing. So, but you really had me on the other yeah. one. Also, I'm shout asking. out to the Black Phone and Smile. I thought they they did a good job too. Yeah. So, no, it's yes. a great. Okay. So this is a genre that there are a lot of movies coming out in the genre, and that is comic book. And we're going to have a lot of things to say about this category. But the Batman was the winner in this category. Totally concur. Absolutely loved the Batman. Best comic book movie of the year. Yes, I will give it that indeed. I just think for me personally, my only pick, my only little nitpick, I felt like it was a little too long. That's every movie these days is a little bit too long. I feel yeah. like I come out of every movie now. Maybe it's because we see so many movies. Yeah. Um, and maybe if you're buying a ticket, you know, a couple times a year, you're going to the movies a few times a year, a few times, you know, every six, few months, maybe you want it. But I, as a film critic, I'm always like, that was 20 minutes too long. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the Batman, uh, from a technical point, I, I think it's phenomenal. I think there are some sequences in this that I think Matt Reeves is a phenomenal filmmaker. I thought it was a really interesting introduction to Batman, kind of very different Batman than we've ever seen before. I thought the cast was great. I thought Colin Farrell was really great as the Penguin. I'm surprised that he's not in more supporting conversations for that role. Um, but I'll be honest with you, though, I, I wasn't as emotionally connected to really? the film. Like if I look at the film I was most emotionally connected to, it would be Wakanda Forever. I thought like that film, yeah. uh, I was a lot more invested in mm -hmm. that film than I was in the Batman, but I was, I guess maybe more visually stimulated by the Batman, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. like I, I, you know, but like for me, I'm an emotional watcher and the films that have my heart are the films that I tend to go towards more. And Wakanda Forever had my heart. This one did not have my heart. Wakanda Forever had my heart. And when I say the best movie for the Batman, it's the best 
overall. There are parts about Wakanda Forever just as much I didn't like, just as much as, you know, the Batman. Yeah. I felt like there are certain story elements that they didn't need to have, but I understood why they were there mm -hmm. because I was like, okay, the first Black Panther is its own standalone film. Yeah. This one, Wakanda Forever, had so much to tackle right out the gate as we know they came out the gate and gave you the emotion of Chadwick's passing like they got it out the way and the rest of the movie reflected on that how they yeah. dealt with that and then the introduction of these characters and again I there was a lot of heart in it Letitia Wright is amazing yeah. and Angela Bassett if she does not get her Oscar finally for this performance there is something wrong with everything yeah. I think she's a front runner at this oh, yeah. point. She has oh, yeah, to be. Yeah, that's it's it, it's, a, it's a done deal. I mean, she's winning every. Yeah, it's, I feel like it's a done deal. Yeah. yeah, I think the film could have could have been in that best picture race too. And I think if it wasn't for like your Avatar and your Top Gun Maverick, I think you'd, you'd see Wakanda forever in there. And I still think that it has a shot at getting a best picture nomination. Do you think Colin would be in the uh, supporting actor race had he not done Banshees? Do you think he would have? They would have pushed that narrative more. Maybe, maybe. But he, you know, it, I think what what I struggle with, he, he's not in the Batman a lot. Like he's got like maybe two or three scenes. Yeah, sure. yeah. And it came um, out a long time and ago. And he doesn't have a scene where it's just like that's your Oscar clip scene that they're gonna play. Right. You know, but I do feel like maybe if he had another couple of scenes and Banshees wasn't here, there would be a little bit more of a of a support for for him for supporting. Yeah. I thought Robert was really great. I thought he was so interesting in it. I love the smoky eye. A girl loves a man in a smoky <laughs> eye. Always keep that in mind. Yep. But no, I just thought, I thought the makeup, not only that, but the makeup was great. The mm. prosthetics, you know, for Colin, unrecognizable was great. Without a that doubt. That scene yeah. where the, you know, they turn the camera on the side and the fire and the, you know, like some of those scenes became iconic. I oh, see yeah. what you're saying though. It's interesting. Do you, but I don't think they were, I think it, it felt very film noir, very glossy, very like that was the yeah, vibe that's what it was, of the whole thing. Sure. But the thing about Matt Reeves is like, I love him as a filmmaker. His, his movies tend to be a little emotionally cold. Uh, and Batman himself as a character is emotionally cold. Right. And so I'm curious to see as they progress through these movies, if they figure out a way for the audience to kind of feel a little bit more invested in these characters. I think Batman's always had that issue. Uh, as a character, and so I'm curious to see how they progress. You know, when you talk about Batman, the part two, you know, as we come into his part two, thinking about the Dark Knight, thinking about Burton's part two, I think a lot of people, yeah. there's gonna be a lot of eyes on that part two as being maybe the film that defines his Batman story. So I'm looking more at that. This felt like a starter. A, a visually spectacular starter, mm -hmm. but I'm looking to be a little bit more invested in your characters and their journey, and, and I want to see that more. This one won three categories, film overall, wide and action adventure, and was our overall, like I said, winner for best picture this year, TGM. My favorite movie of the year, Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> you want to feel good? You want all the great emotions? You want to just enjoy yourself for almost two for two hours? That's what Top Gun Maverick is. You want to watch Tom Cruise realize how short he really is in real life? Tom Cruise Maverick. <laughs> Tom, Tom, Top Gun Maverick, excuse me. Yeah, I, look, my favorite movie of the year. I think it. it's a film that feels like a throwback, but it also feels very modern. It gives you, every, like you're laughing, you're cheering, you're feeling heartache, you're crying, mm -hmm. you're on the edge of your seat. Like in terms of a movie saying, we're gonna give you the buffet of everything that you want to experience as a moviegoer, uh, but do it well and, and have a, a tight script. This movie does that. It does a great job of nodding to the original Top Gun, but you just don't have to have seen the original Top Gun, but it does enhance the experience. Um, and I think Cruise is great. I think the cast, the all the, the pilots, the young pilots that they found were fantastic. The fact that they're all in these planes flying, you see their reactions, you, you, you feel the fact that they were doing this themselves. I think that adds to it. Uh, and then I honestly, we don't get a lot of really memorable soundtrack songs this year. And I think them bringing Lady Gaga in, I think that Hold My Hand mu uh, music, Chills. that song, mm -hmm. not only does it play over the credits, but they use the melody of it throughout the film and they seed it inside the film. And we don't see a lot of that these days. We saw it in the 90s and the 80s, not these days. And so it's a great soundtrack movie and it just really does everything right. Um, and I, I, I mean, it's just fantastic. So, I mean, yeah, like it deserves everything that it does. It deserves best picture. The, the reunion of sorts of Iceman and Maverick, mm -hmm. 
is the most emotional thing I think you see on screen because all we already knew about Val Kilmer in real life. Mm -hmm. And again, when you get that first early text from Ice and Maverick texting in the bar, and matter of fact, even when he walks into Top Gun and he sees his picture, you have these little moments and it's all building up to the two of them together in person. And again, everything else around it, everybody flying the planes, watching him at the very beginning go Mach 10 and, and to watch him go, look, we only need 10. Not 10.1, not 10.2, but him right. still being who he is. Him teaching the pilots, be like that, but look, kind of pull back if you got to. And them like, no, we can do this. We're the best. Everything hit on all cylinders with this yeah. movie. And, you know, we're talking about awards and this won our award and we're talking about award season. And this is the first time in a long time where we could have a Titanic year where a blockbuster wins Best Picture. I'm all for it. I would love that to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. There's a shot, maybe. I mean, there's a shot the way it's talked about again, just how yeah. you two felt seeing it at CinemaCon. I've, I know people who went three, four times to the movies yep. to watch this movie <laughs> in particular. So, you know, and then who's to say how the voters go? But it does have a shot. But then you have Top Gun Maverick, everything, everywhere, all at once. Tar seems to be a front runner now. So you have all these different movies. It's just like, what's going to sway these voters which way? Yeah, and you, the Oscars are a little complicated. They have something called a preferential ballot. So it's not just about like the movie that gets the top vote, but it's also like the movie that gets like the second and your third and your fourth and your fifth vote. And I think the thing that benefits Top Gun Maverick is everybody's going to have it in their top three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's just that kind of movie for everybody. And so I think that's why it may have a shot at getting that best picture. And I'm curious to see. I hope it gets it. Uh, I think blockbusters kind of need it. Um, but I, I look at like what a best picture should be, yeah. and I look at what that film has achieved, and I'm like, that that is what a best picture should be, in my opinion. A hundred percent. But I think we've gotten used to in the last couple of years. The last few years have all been about the Nomad Lands and and that kind of movie. Mm -hmm. And I think we've sort of trained ourselves to thinking that a smaller movie, a small sort of like gritty whatever movie that nobody watched, mm -hmm. that nobody deserves watched best yeah. deserves the best picture. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like yeah. and that didn't used to be the way it was, like in the late nineties, early two thousands. Like bigger films were winning things. And that was, you know, they weren't always blockbusters per se, for everybody probably li listening and watching, going, Well, they weren't blockbusters. Of course they weren't the blockbuster, but they were bigger, bigger movies. Yeah, yeah, look at yeah. like Forrest Gump or Tapo or or Titanic or Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Right. Like, yeah. like I felt like, yeah, like you, you make a good point of like that mid to late 90s, early 2000s. There was this era where like those big movies were being recognized at, uh, as best picture. But now we've gotten into this way where and I think that's to a certain degree why award shows are struggling is because a lot of these best picture nominees are films that people just haven't seen and they don't know of or they're not connecting with and they're maybe too, a little too high brow and that's not to say that there isn't room for those films to be there but i think that these blockbuster films that connect with a lot of people on a big scale deserve a seat at the table yeah and i think it's starting to change and this is you know there's been a couple years coming you know with black panther being nominated mm -hmm. and that and i hopefully if it doesn't happen this year i don't know what's going to happen again but um a couple honorable mentions RRR was in this category. It is one of my favorite <laughs> movies of the year. That movie is incredible. If you it's have not amazing. seen it, I, oh my God. I didn't know, I saw the trailer. Like when I first saw the trailer and I remember my buddies Jason M and Ashley Robinson showed me the trailer. It was like, you gotta watch this trailer. And I was like, well, what is this? <laughs> it was just, I'm seeing lions and tigers, all this jumping. And they're like, oh, this is nothing compared to the movie. And it's three hours that flow by, flow by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's wild, and I'm I'm happy for its success because I think it's also putting indie Indian cinema, uh, uh, you know, on yeah. a bigger stage. Yes. You know, and, and a lot of a lot of my friends that that watch a lot of Indian cin cinema, they they kind of joke about RRR because they're like, "Where have you been?" Like, this is what they're they're that's what they do, you know. But I think RRR just had a, like a much higher budget. But like, you know, I, I, I think this is putting that kind of cinema back on the map. I think we're seeing a lot more of those movies kind of come over to the United States. Uh, at least at Fandango, we're seeing a lot of them in the in the ticket sales, like top top 10, yeah. you know? And so I, I, I'm happy for Indian cinema and for all of those fans to have that kind of representation because we, we don't see those films represented in this way. And, and so, you know, congrats to RRR for breaking through for sure. Wrap up everybody. We're going to do a quick mention of the rest of the winners in the film categories. Documentary was Fire of Love. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Drama, foreign language film, and limited happening. Kids and family, the winner was 
Royal Dolls, Matilda the Musical. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Even though I did read, read his books as a child, I never knew how to pronounce his name. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. Mystery Thriller. Ah, uh, what we talked about before. Glass Onion, mm -hmm. a Knives Out Mystery. Romance was Girl Picture. Congratulations to all of our RT Golden Tomato winners. I want to thank you both, Jay Washington. Tell everybody where they can find you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again. I love working with both of you and being you all, being here with you all. You all are just amazing in general. Ditto, just, likewise. Love all the here. love. Yes. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Mr. and TikTok at Mr. Jay Washington, M R J A Y. You should know how to spell Washington. Uh, the Mad Titan Podcast, where I get you caught up on all the things happening in the Marvel and DC live action cinematic universes. It is Barbershop Talk for Nerds. Uh, and also American Jiggle on Showtime. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, and you're so talented, and we love having you. Eric, where can everybody find you? I'm here. This couch turns into, a, it turns into a bed, and I just live here. Uh, but other than that, uh, Eric Davis, Eric with a K on Twitter. That's usually, that's like my main, my main jam. Uh, that's like my blog. And so follow me over there. And then Fandango. Just follow Fandango, and, and we're doing a bunch of really cool things. Our Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania interview is out. Got a bunch of big interviews coming out. Going to be a big year, and so just follow us uh, I follow this man religiously on Twitter. All of, if you want to get the best entertainment movie news that, and you're up to like the minute up, caught up, follow this man. Yeah. He's incredible. Yeah. You are both Thank amazing. You. Thank you to our audience for joining. And just a reminder for you guys to take part in our fan poll vote. The QR code is on the screen right now. So just scan that QR code and cast your vote and then tune into the Rotten Tomatoes is wrong golden tomato award uh, episode to see if what you voted for won we want to thank you again for joining us on another episode of the after show this one was so special near and dear to my heart and i had two of my favorite people joining so thanks again to everybody and we'll see you on the next one bye <laughs>